All right, friends. Um, I think I think I'm going to start. Uh, for those who's going to join later on, uh, they're also welcome to just fall in, although they can't hear me. Um, yes, welcome. I'm excited. I'm excited tonight. We uh, we we were not able to finish off last week, so we're definitely going to finish off tonight. Um, and uh, we have something in our hearts that we would like to ponder on and share with you. So we trust God to the Holy Spirit to lead us tonight. So I just feel it in my heart. I'd like to pray and uh, then we'll get get tonight going. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of Jesus for this opportunity to gather around your word. Your word is life. Your word is truth. And Lord, we are opening our hearts tonight for your word to have its full and complete work in us. Uh, guide our lips to speak only what you want us to speak and uh, enlighten the hearts and minds of everyone that is logged in tonight. We bless your name. We say thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, the Beatitudes, I'm going to do a very, very quick recap of what we discussed last week. And uh, then we'll, we'll finish up. We, we said the Beatitudes was delivered at the Sermon uh, on the Mount, which is uh, beside the Sea of Galilee. I'm not going to show you the, the Google map again, but you will remember it is in the north, northern, northern region of um, Israel. There's a beautiful little church that they've built there, a Roman Catholic Church in the 1930s. I'll show you this picture. That's a view from the church looking down to the Sea of Galilee. And there are some wonderful, uh, uh, well, all the Beatitudes are actually lined along the path as you walk up to this church. Um, let me scroll to the very first Beatitude. And that is, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, this, this is... Uh, what Jesus explained to the people to say that to be poor in spirit means to not rely on your own strength and own confidence. All right. It is fully relying on God. That is what poor in spirit means. The next one, which is blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. You remember I said that uh, uh, this morning it's it's talking about a person mourning about the state of their own sinful nature, the state of the world of sin around them. And in that state of being uh, saddened by the sin that they see, it will drive a person to repentance. And in that arises a great blessing. Then uh, Matthew 5 verse 5, blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. And this one, I, I went back and I did some, some digging on it because as I, as I spoke about this last week, it was just impressed in me strongly to talk about this inheriting the earth is not just talking about inheriting material things. It is actually mostly speaking about inheriting spiritual things. Um, but there is definitely a dual meaning, and that's what I want to highlight here. All right, so, so the first... The first meaning I want to talk about is inheriting physical land. Um, Psalm 37 verse 29 is a very good example. And it says, then the consistently righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The Old Testament is full of these kind of promises where for righteous living, the reward is land at the end of the day. Why the focus on land? The covenant with Abraham, God promised him great lands will come to him. So land is a very big part of the covenant and therefore the blessing of the Lord. So it is not wrong to expect inheriting material blessing for the humble and gentle person. But the main focus that I want to highlight here is the second meaning, the spiritual land, the kingdom of God. And this has to do with um, inheriting people in that sense that People starting to serve God, they become part of God's kingdom. And that is a much greater blessing because that is eternal. 
as opposed to just inheriting a piece of land uh, on the earth. All right. And then how do we know the focus here is mostly geared towards the spiritual kingdom? The rest of Matthew chapter 5 speaks about this new spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand. All the parables that follow, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is likened to. So the spiritual kingdom is the focus of Matthew chapter 5. Right. Let's go to the next next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In other words, striving to live the right way. Then a person will discover that brings true satisfaction in life. All right. So hunger and thirst, not necessarily for food, but for doing the right things. They will be satisfied. They will be at peace in their hearts, not having that constant emptiness and longing for the next best thing, the next best thing, the next best thing. That is what this one is talking about. Right. Here is where we got to last week. Blessed are the merciful. And uh, this one really touched my heart because I think God was speaking to us about we are too much hard on ourselves and hard of people. We need to operate in greater mercy. Now, here, Matthew chapter uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, is a great deal, uh, is, a, is a great value deal. Let's call it like that. I love a good deal. And I, and I know some of you out there also, you love a good deal. Here is an excellent deal. Look at this deal that you're getting here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, this merciful, um, if I go to my beloved um, Eastward, let's go to chapter uh, uh, verse 7, and I want my King James. Um, look at this uh, uh, Greek word of merciful. This talks about uh, compassionate, actively merciful. So this is a verb, all right? So this is talking about a person having mercy, doing merciful acts towards others, all right? So it's me being merciful towards others. Look at the, the blessing that will come their way, all right? They shall obtain mercy. Look at this kind of mercy. I'm going to do this. So it's that G... One six five five three. To compassionate by word or deed, specifically by divine grace. So this is the divine kind of mercy. All right. So why am I saying it's a good deal? Let me go back. You give mercy, the human kind of mercy, the human kind of grace, which is limited. Look what you receive in turn. You will receive mercy from people. And you will see, receive the mercy from God. So that is the divine grace. So you give as best as you can your humanly mercy. And you are going to reap heavenly mercy. That to me is an excellent deal. And I also quoted the, the parable about the, uh, the, the, the person who, who owed money. Matthew 18 uh, verse 23, so God's kingdom is like a king who decided to collect the money his servants owed, owed him. Let's quickly go there. i like to, I like us to see this. Matthew chapter 18. Let's go to verse 23. All right, I'm going to put it in a, a slightly in, easier. So God's kingdom is like a king who decided to collect the money his servants, servants owed him. The king began to collect his money. One servant owed him several thousand pounds of silver. He was not able to pay the money to his master, the king. So the master ordered that he and everything he owned be sold, his wife and his children, the money would be used to pay the king, the servant what he owed. But the servant fell on his knees and begged, be patient with me. I will pay you everything I own. And the master felt sorry for him. I'm sure if I go to the King James Version, my, my uh, concordance, moved with compassion. All right. So that is not entirely the same compassion that we've seen, seen, seen uh, before. But he felt it on the inside to have mercy on this person. And he forgave him the debt and let him go. All right. I'm going to stop there and read one more verse. Then the man went out and met the, one of his fellow servants who owed him a few dollars. He grabbed him and started choking him. Pay back what you owe me. 
Now, this man was, the Bible says he was wicked because he received mercy, but he did not pass it on. That is the complete opposite to what Jesus is describing in the Beatitudes. He wants us to have mercy so that we can obtain mercy. All right, let's go on. Blessed are the, this is verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. All right, now, with this one, I had a, I won't say I had a struggle, but I had to meditate. I had to meditate to have this meaning and uh, explanation really stand out for me. Because I reasoned it in, in the following manner. If you are born again, you are going to go to heaven. So it means you are definitely going to see God. So this verse is, is to me, it was slightly contradictory because we all, all of us are going to see God. Even I think the unbelievers, when the day of judgment comes, they will also see God and they will be forced to bow their knees in fear and trembling. So in a sense, every you, every living being that ever existed, they will see God. So why is this scripture then so unique? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Um, now, to, to, to understand this, we need to go to the Old Testament, Psalm 24. There the word says, who shall go up to the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So if you read the Old Testament, again, it talks about the pure heart and a clean heart. That person will be standing in the holy place of God. All right. Now remember, Jesus is not talking about the kingdom that is to come. He's talking about this kingdom. This is the context we must see it in. Let's go to let's go to the the uh, Hebrew and Greek translations. Matthew chapter five and uh, pure heart. And let's do King James. All right. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now look at this, look at this word. Uh, this word is talking about, I'm going to highlight that one. Properly to stare at. That is to discern clearly, physically or mentally. By extension to attend to. By Hebraism to experience passively to appear. Behold, perceive, see, take heed. So what this seeing God means it is experiencing the presence of God. It is to appear in front of God. It is to sense his presence. All right. Um, and and I want to want to take you back to maybe some of you experience this. If you if you in a in a in a in a in a in a worship setting, for example, and there are you are feeling guilty or convicted of something. You are not pure in heart, for example. Let's just use that now. You are you are unpure because you came to the service. You've done some stuff wrong. You shouted at your wife while you got out of the car. There's, you are worshipping God. You sense zero His presence because of not having a pure heart. So this pure heart, what it's referring to, is to be in a position where you spiritually you are seeing God. Not Physically, he's sitting in front of you or you appearing at his throne. You are in the uh, in the gaze of God. You are experiencing, you can sense his presence. Because if I read Psalm 24, it says, stand in his holy place. Now, his holy place, we can sense it uh, here on earth. Jesus made provision that we can enter into the holy of holies. So the pure in heart. To have a real relationship that you can experience God and experience his presence. There is the requirement. The pure in heart. And this does not apply to one day when you will see God. Because the whole world, like I said, even the unpure, they will become, there will be a day when they will have to appear in front of God. And they will also see him in fear and trembling. All right. So, so this, this was a, this was a, this was one I had to meditate on and, and just ask God for guidance. Lord, what are you trying to tell us here? All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, this is also a, this is also one I had to think about and meditate. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Blessed are the makers 
and maintainers of peace, for they will be called the sons of God. All right. Blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace, for they will be called the sons of God. That's the beatitude. Now let's look at another scripture. Because if I read sons of God, uh, in the Old Testament, sons of God has a few meanings. In the, in the very beginnings of Genesis, sons of God usually refers to angels or fallen angels. This, obviously, it's not those sons of God. Later on, when the prophets come, they talk about sons of God. Then it talks, then it means the prophets. This is also not talking about the prophets. So then, what's left over? Sons of God are children of God. Right, now, let's look at this verse with the eyes of the children of God. Blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace, for they will be called the sons of God. The children of God, the born again ones. However, in my mind, if I see son of God, to me it's a person that's born again. That's serving God. Then you become a son and daughter of God. So how come is, is this scripture slightly different? Let's read Galatians 3 verse 26. Because you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is how you become a son of God. All right. You are a son or daughter of God through your faith in Jesus Christ. And I was, was going over this and I was reading it and I was reading it. And then the following word caught my attention. They will be called sons of God. This verse does not say they will be sons of God. They will be called the sons of God. Subtle difference in the wording, but big implication in the, in, in the meaning. Now let's, let's bring it back to those of us who are parents. I've got two sons. Let's say I have a sit down with my sons. And I use the words. I call him my son. Instead of calling them on their names. My son. How are you today? My son, I want to teach you a lesson today. If I speak like that to my children. It's a much more intimate way of talking to them. If I, if I call them by name. It's usually I'm angry or I need to discipline and it's more strict. But when it's my son, my daughter, a lot of affection. Another example, let's say there's a crowd of there's a crowd of children. I'm at school or at church and my my children are there. I can call them by name. And they might look at me and they might respond to me for the bystanders. That doesn't necessarily uh, uh, indicate to them. These two children are my, my sons or my daughters. But if I say this in this crowd, my sons, come here. I announce to everybody around me, Matein and Enzo, they are my sons. So there's, a, again, there's that affection, that declaration of they are my sons. Okay? Because I call them my sons. Now, this is, this is how I understand this scripture. The makers of peace, those people who exhibit this attitude, the way God will, uh, 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 the way that the blessing will come to them, they will be called the sons of God. There will be a special, let's call it affection, brought upon them. They will be announced to the world as, hey, these people belong to me. Look at great evangelists and, uh, you know, workers of, of, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not going to call names, but people who have made an impact in the kingdom. They are publicly acknowledged as God's, God's people, God's warriors. They are being called the sons of God. So, so, so God bestows this, um, this, uh, not title, but this affectionate way of referring to his children. He makes it public for the world to know, to see. This person is my son. And whom I am well pleased. Like, he, like, uh, like uh, the, the voice that came out of the heaven when Jesus was baptized. All right. So, 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 so I hope you can see that when you are busy studying the word of God. God is definitely not confused. When there are certain words in sentences that. Or slightly different. It's there for a reason. God wants us to 
really dig in to get the meaning. If if I don't understand the word, it's not because God made a mistake. It's because I've not taken the time to understand it. Therefore, I want to motivate you. Get that tool like this. This is my tool. This is my resource that I use. There's there's a dictionary here. There's oh look at all these translations. There's all sorts of descriptions. Yes, some study notes. All my Bible school stuff is here. Um, this is my tool that I use to understand the word. Because the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Right? So what you need to do is, and what I need to do is, use all the tools available. Maybe it's Afrikaans translation. Maybe it's Afrikaans dictionary. Maybe it's the Webster's English. Whatever you need to use, use those tools. Or even phone a friend. To make sure you understand the word. Because the word is not un understandable. Because God would not leave us with something that's his own words that are not understandable to us. All right. Let's go to the next one. I think this is the last beatitude. Um, and I rather want to uh, read this again in my, uh, in my eastward. I'm going to, uh, let's do this one. Great blessing belongs to those who suffer persecution for doing what is right. God's kingdom belongs to them. Okay, again, I'm going to highlight that. We're going to come back to that now. God's kingdom belongs to them. Now, remember, if I'm born again, God's kingdom also belongs to me. Or, or let me rather say it like this. If I'm born again, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. There might be an aspect of God's kingdom on earth that I don't experience, but I'm definitely going to heaven. This God's kingdom here does not talk about heaven. This talks about the kingdom on earth that Jesus came to release and explain to us. Why do I say that? Let's carry on. People will insult you and hurt you. They will lie and say all kinds of evil things about you because you follow me. But when they do that, know that great blessings belong to you. Now the, the key verse. Be happy about it. Be very glad because you have great reward waiting for you. Where? In heaven. The reward is in. Now this, this talks about the eternal kingdom. This talks about the day we die and we're going to be with God. So these few scriptures says, uh, 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 if you suffer persecution for the sake of Jesus, now in this world you are suffering this kingdom of God that he's released to us that we can live in now, that belongs to you. But not only that, because you are suffering all these things, you are suffering insults, people say evil things about you, which is not true. Look what the reward of that is. Be happy, be very glad you have a great reward waiting for you in heaven. All right. So Jesus is saying they persecuted him. They said nasty things about him. His own disciples turned against him. That did not cause him to lose focus and stop what he was, was here to do. He was focusing on the end goal. Same for all the people here on earth who gets persecuted, martyrs. Also, even us, you know, us, you and I, we also get, uh, uh, get persecuted. Just talk about God on your Facebook and Twitter profile. Not that I do that, but I know of somebody who, uh, more than one person, who lost their work because they said what the Bible said on their uh, Facebook profile and they were called into the workplace. What you're saying, yeah, we don't agree with, sorry, here's your papers. Once you again, that's persecution. That's straight persecution. All right, so... Um, that is, that is what I want to say about the Beatitudes. So to quickly summarize, kingdom that we are experiencing here on earth that we must live by. Poor in spirit, which means we rely on God. Mourning, we are repenting of our sins. Meekness, we don't think highly of ourselves, but we are gentle. Hunger for righteousness, we want to do the right things right. Mercy, we've spent a lot of time on that. We are having mercy towards others. Purity, it's a clean heart living right. 
If you do that, you will experience the presence of God. Making peace, the opposite of making war and being wicked and being harsh and aggressive, and then willingness to be persecuted, to be persecuted for God's account. Now, this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and we've already spent two nights on it. Uh, well, this is our second evening. Uh, uh, the richness of these scriptures are amazing. And uh, 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 Jesus is telling us as a church, listen, and, and I'm almost ready to hand over to Pastor Yaku. He's going to share something. But uh, 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 what we see around us today is completely opposite of this, what Jesus is teaching. So to us, this is, is in a sense, a wake up call to say, ignore the noises. We need to make sure we do what Jesus is expecting of us. Let, let the noises not uh, 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 be so loud that we're not hearing the voice of Jesus. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Yaku, I'm just checking. Are you ready uh, for me to hand over to you? Christy, yes, I am. Thank okay, you Okay, I'm much. going to stop my screen sharing, and then I'm handing o over to you. Thank you, Christy. So, uh, friends, again, good evening from my side. Uh, after each and every week, when we have our sessions uh, and when we share with you, Christu, myself and Alwyn, we get together and we just discuss and we just reflect on the evening. And you would remember that last week, especially, we really felt that God wanted to impress a specific message upon our hearts through this uh, 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 teaching on the Beatitudes. And it was actually initiated a week or two even prior to that when Alwyn shared with us uh, and when he also shared uh, about Jesus and the preparation for his ministry. You will remember that at uh, the week before last. We really realized that God wanted us just to just to go back and just to re-emphasize one or two things that maybe we as the church need to be alert to currently. So what we have come up with, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes just to lay this foundation, just honestly to share with you what it is we have uh, and we have felt the Holy Spirit pressing on our hearts. Uh, Christo has been sharing about the Beatitudes. So let me just share this with you uh, quickly in laying a foundation for where we want to go for the rest of the evening. So that day when Jesus stood in front of the crowd on that mountain, the people had many of the same challenges you and I have today. And friends, this is important that you just take note of this. If you go and study this and research this politically, racially, economically, personally, the people were faced with many of the same things. They were in, in situations that you and I found ourselves in today. The world really has not changed a lot when it comes to the challenges that we are facing as a people. We are consistently tempted to be something else that God intended for us to be. I'm going to say this again. We are continuously tempted to be something else that God intended for us to be. Today, people continue to be angry. People continue to be greedy. People continue to be divided. They are profane in their actions. And many people around us are just very depressed because of what is going on. You will remember leading up to, to even tonight and as we started speaking about Jesus and even in the beginning when we started this whole journey that God created us with a certain uh, idea. He wanted us, we were created in his image. He wanted us to live a specific way. But through sin that entered, he had to give us Jesus who we are speaking about now to come and just 
show us the way back to what it is he intended for us right from the start. Today still, the people back then, when he was standing on that mountain, the people back then were challenged. Today still, the people are being challenged. We are constantly being challenged by going a different route, by doing something uh, uh, that God did not intend for us at all. We are constantly being tempted to give in to the standards of the world. Friends, and as we spoke to one another and as we shared, there's so many things going on around us today. There are so many things that wants to pull us down. There are so many things that wants to sidetrack us, that wants to get our focus off of what it is God intended for us. To be these things that Christu has been sharing. Jesus was also tempted, friends. He gave us a sermon on the mount. He did not give in. Now this evening, in laying a foundation for what it is we want to share with you going forward, we want to encourage you as teachers. Remember, we, are, we, are, we, we want to discover the person of the Bible. We want to discover the person of the word. And if there's one thing that we feel as teachers currently, that God, through his word, is impressing upon us, is that we must not be sidetracked. There's so many things that wants to get our focus away from God. There's so many things happening in our lives that wants to get us down and get us discouraged and get us angry and that wants us to be everything that the B attitudes is telling us not to be. Jesus was tempted in this way. And in going forward this evening, I'm handing back to Christu to share with us and to show you. And again, I say it's something that Alwyn touched on a couple of weeks ago. But we just feel we want to go back to those that specific day that Jesus was tempted in the desert by the devil. And let's just see how Jesus dealt with this. He overcame. Let us follow his example in order for us to also overcome. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jakub. All right, friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen with you again. So I, I have this uh, uh, famous saying, well, I won't say it's famous, but I always, I always say it and I repeat it often every time I teach. I have this thing that I say, if, if you're looking for a certain answer, the place to find the answer to whatever problem it is, you'll find it in the Word. I that, mean. Is, that is my, just how it is. You find the answer in the Word. The trick for you is, to go find the answer first, then you can implement it. Um, no use, you know the answer is somewhere in the word, but but you are you don't know how to go and find it. So so this is where study comes in, so that you are equipped to know how to find. We are landing on this topic of the temptation of Jesus. Us as the church, we've just identified we are being bombarded to not live the way the Beatitudes and the rest of the word wants us to live. We are bombarded. So it's a it's a great temptation. How do we overcome that temptation as a as an individual and as a church? The only thing I've got or the answer I've got, let's look to Jesus. He was bombarded and tempted by the devil. How did he handle that situation? That is what we need to go and look at and implement in our own lives so that we can overcome that temptation. All right. So Matthew chapter four, verse one. Then the spirit led Jesus into the desert. He was taken there to be tempted by the devil. Now, in this, in this example, the Holy Spirit took him there. It was part of preparation of his ministry, and he was being tempted. Now, certain temptations come our way, which is uh, uh, in, uh, uh, because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. But other things are just the world that is pressing in upon us. So it doesn't matter which temptation or who, who is inducing that temptation. The principle is you go back to the word 
to fight that temptation. All right, here we go. Jesus ate nothing for 40 days and nights. After this, he was very hungry. The devil came to tempt him and said, If you are the son of God, tell these rocks to become bread. Can you see what he is challenging? He's challenging his, uh, are you the son of God? Are you really born again? Are you really, the, are you really who you think you are? Look at the challenge. That's the first one. And the second one, he's speaking to the flesh. The flesh is being challenged. Now, let's, this, this really uh, summarizes uh, uh, the challenge we as, as God's people have in the challenge of the flesh. And I'm sure we're going to read this. How, how are we to deal with the temptation to rely on self, fall for sin, lose faith in God? The first temptation, in summary, to describe it is to live for material self-empowerment. So it's to live for the material things and for the self in the material things. The temptation is directed at the flesh. The first temptation summarized. Christians even become addicted to their own material, psychological body chemistry. Serial money making, addiction to being the center of attention socially, addictions to shopping, to exercise, Here's a funny one, computer gaming, but it's a real problem for some people. Uh, these, these things I've, I've said here, yeah, these are less obvious substance abuse. It's not the bad things that we're going to get to now, but they are all examples of addiction and scenarios that generate the feel-good body chemistry. We do these things because the flesh wants to feel good about itself. We want, we want that recognition that satisfaction this is this is and the world is feeding us you know i get my email every morning one day only good specials right there's i like to shop there because i get a good deal what do i see there i see shoes there what i like i see i see fitness devices i see all everything that i see there is through the eyes it appeals to the flesh it's not necessary that i good for me, but it's there. It's a temptation. Uh, they want me to pull out my credit card. Let's look at the next one. Alcoholism, alcoholism, gluttony, drug abuse are obvious examples, but should not be used as a scapegoat to hide uh, from exposing more subtle addictions. There are many, many addictions that Christians struggle with. Phone addiction, this thing. Try to go a whole day without looking at your phone. I'll probably look at my phone Maybe a thousand times a day. I don't know. We're addicted to this little thing. All right. So uh, the whole entertainment industry, celebrity culture, self-enthroning activity that involves addiction to certain feeling uh, states in a manner that presupposes a disastrous and idolatrous disconnect from God and from communion and covenant with God. So friends, in every, in what I'm trying to say is, all these things are designed to satisfy the flesh and appeal to the flesh. Because when we rely on the flesh, we don't have to rely on God. That is why all these things come our way. And we must be very, very uh, careful. In other words, rely on self and satisfy self. Now, uh, uh, in context, let's look at the Beatitudes. Which Beatitude does this this temptation contradict Matthew chapter 5 verse 6. This is just how I interpret it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be full. We hunger and thirst for food, for things to drink. We hunger and thirst to put certain clothes on. These are the things that people hunger or the temptation comes our way to hunger and thirst for the wrong things. Yet Jesus is saying, Rather hunger and thirst to do the right things. All right, let's, uh, let's look at how Jesus was fighting this temptation. Jesus answered him. The scriptures say, it is not just bread that keeps people alive. Their lives depend on what God says. All right, total reliance on God. Total reliance on God. Uh, uh, the lesson here is, those temptations that come our way, how do we fight it? 
with a word. For example, let's just say this is a fleshly thing, jealousy. Let's say I have a problem with jealousy. It comes up by me all the time. And I want to be jealous of this one and that one. They've got more than me. And they. How do I fight that? If I identify that problem in my life, what must I do? I go find all the scriptures on jealousy. And I go meditate on it. And I go see, oh, yes, it's a problem in my life. Let me re firstly repent. And... Uh, proclaim those scriptures over my life. And that is how I would, for example, take care of that problem in my life. All right, that's, that is just the first one. Let's quickly go to the second one. The second temptation, live for the spiritual self-empowerment. In brackets, they're controlling God. All right, what, the, what did the devil do? He said to Jesus, Then the devil led Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem and put him on a high place at the edge of the temple area. He said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, jump off, because the scriptures say God will command his angels to help you and their hands will catch you so that you will not hit the, your foot on a rock. Look how clever he is. He is speaking to the faith of Jesus. He's quoting a scripture. He's speaking to the spiritual angle. He's taking a spiritual angle. You are you 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 are a you are a faith man. Come on, exercise your faith. You got faith on the inside. Exercise it. Why don't you want to exercise? There's nothing wrong with exercising your faith. And this is a this is a grave temptation. The second temptation summarized. Satan asserts that. Since the scripture states that God will protect Jesus, then this is a sure way to effect divine rescue. And this is the sin on demand, forcing God's hand. So what this is doing is using the spiritual sense to get your own way, to force God's hand by manipulating, trying to manipulate the spiritual or the religious or the humanistic way of thinking into getting God to do what you want to do. Right. So what I've said, the examples of this and the occultic magic. Now, I don't want to go into that, but there's there's people who really do hocusy pocusy stuff, meddling in the spiritual world. Uh, that falls under this category. Humanism. Man is always right. Man is the keeper of his own destiny. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all those humanistic ideas that has crept into all the countries and, and, and governments of the world. Religious legalism. So to the letter, no grace. And then there's also distorted charismatic religion, where, whereby I want to say uh, 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 overly focus on the, uh, on the material. Uh, overly focus on name it and claim it. And it's, and it's easy. You just step one, two, three, four, and you've got it. So, so you see the, the I want it my way, and I find a, a, a find a way to convince myself or to try and convince God, I'm sure you can do it my way, because there, there is a scripture for it. So you see that. So it's without hearing God's voice first before implementing. Look what the uh, 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 attitude this contradicts, Matthew 5, chapter 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. Pure in heart. All these things that I talk about is the opposite of pure in heart. This is a dirty heart. All right? So this is all of these things is opposite to what Jesus have taught. Let me go to the last one. Oh, sorry. Before I go to the last one, apologies. I need to tell you how Jesus overcame this one. Uh, Jesus answered to this temptation. Matthew 4 verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. All right? You shall not put God to the test. You shall not say, God, um, you will do what I say. That is basically what this, this scripture is saying. It is... It is uh, uh, man trying to manipulate God. There's only one scripture in the Bible that I know of where God says, you may test me in this. And that's found in Malachi chapter 3, where God says, test me in this. So you're allowed to test God. And that talks about tithes and offerings. You're allowed to test God in your tithes and offerings. God invites you to do it. But for the rest, 
we are not allowed to to say i'm going to do it my way god please find a way to fit your will into my will that is not wrong Ach, that is not going to work that is that is wrong in other words be humble know your place god commands your life not the other way around you know we sometimes want to be so self-righteous and we know all the scriptures and we want to use those scriptures to tell God what he must do. No, God must use the scriptures to tell us what we must do. Right, last one. The third temptation, let's quickly read it. Um, then the devil led Jesus to the top of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the wonderful things in them. The devil said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all these things. All right. So the devil is trying to get Jesus to denounce the Lord in favor of what the world has to offer. That's basically what he's saying there. S live for social self-empowerment, self-exaltation, making the self great. You can see with all these temptations, it's got a very big self element. The third temptation summarized. The lure here is the desire for power, fame, and fortune. And it's not necessarily wrong with uh, godly power, godly fame, and godly fortune. But look what I said here. At the expense of God, basically denying God, saying, all right, God, nothing's going to stop me in pursuing X, Y, or Z. Putting you behind me. Examples of the sin: sin pride, self-seeking, atheism. Atheism just is is simply uh, it is it is a form of faith, and it's a form of faith in self because it's the reluctance to agree that you need the Lord. Right? I don't need God. I've said it there. I determine my own destiny. In other words, no matter what the cost, strive for worldly success. Contradicts Matthew five chapter three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember I said poor in spirit means we are totally relying on the Lord. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All right, they shall inherit. What, what's the difference between all of this? With inherit and all of these things. These things, you fight for it. You have to fight for this uh, self-exaltation. If you inherit something, it's just given to you. It's just your portion. It comes your way. All right, so this is the this is the, the third temptation. And uh, how does Jesus answer this temptation? Matthew 4, verse 10. Then Jesus answered, go away, Satan. He commands him, go away. The scripture says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So I, I, I want to summarize in this the world and and, and 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 i'm really uh, blaming the world again and i'm blaming media and i'm blaming the system and even the education system to some extent these things i've spoken about now is being forced upon us constantly we, we in a sense cannot get away with it if you need to get away with it you must go to heaven because it's everywhere on earth and it has always been there and it will always be there. Maybe the intensity and method of delivery is, is just different. The point is, uh, we need to be vigilant and look how Jesus fought these temptations and make sure we identify it and say, behind me, Satan, uh, the word of the Lord says X, Y, and Z. Whatever the situation presents itself as a temptation, you find the scripture and you come against that in Jesus' name. So, friends, this is uh, this is this is what I have to say. Uh, uh, I trust that that God had a purpose behind this message. I trust that uh, uh, we were we were really sensitive to what God uh, uh, wanted to do. Uh, certainly, I know for for a fact in my life, God has pressed a few buttons and spoken a few uh, uh, truths to me. And we really trust uh, uh, it is the same on your side. I'm going to give over to Elwin now. If there's any any questions, or if Elwin has been very quiet tonight, maybe he wants to make a contribution. But I'm going to hand over to Elwin now for questions and uh, and what he wants to say. Thank you, Elwin. 
Thank you, Krista. It's very true. I think that we constantly being bombarded on every side to do exactly the opposite. Self-enrichment, self-esteem, self-elevation, and uh, to to renege our dependency on God and His Word. And uh, yeah, that is that is the problem. Um, and I agree with you 100%. It, it starts from, uh, you know, if I look at my grandkids, I see what they bombarded with, um, and they are only two and three years old already. Um, so for us, as as uh, the more mature, I'm not saying that makes any difference, but uh, the, the method of delivery is far greater than it was when we were perhaps younger. But now it's on every side. No matter where you turn, there's always something that is being thrown at you to to lure you away from what God wants to do. Um, there's nothing. There's no um, questions in the chat box. If anybody has a question, you please just raise your hand, and we'll we'll uh, allow you to do that. But please, as as per the the rules that we have, just stay with the subject uh, and uh, uh, on what has been released this evening, and not your opinions or anything else. So let's just stay with the topic. Is there any questions? Anyone want to ask something? Just remember, this is for you, so you're free to do so. While the people are pondering, I think I agree with you also, Krista, that uh, it certainly has pressed some buttons in my life, and I know Pastor Yakus as well, as we've, as we've discussed this. And I trust also that the Holy Spirit has just brought some enlightenment in, in everyone's life this evening, so that there's an area or something that we just need to, to be careful of or to be watchful about. Anybody got any questions? Anyone want to say something? Everyone seems to be very quiet this evening, Krista. I think you you really uh, brought the message out. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Alwyn. Um, Pastor Yaku, is there anything yes. um, you'd like to, to contribute? And, and, and if not, then I'm going to ask you to then just close for us. And then close in prayer, and then we will uh, we will then uh, uh, let the people go and log off, and we'll we'll do our greeting. So, Pastor Yaku, over to you, please. Uh, Christy, thank you very much. Uh, again, so friends, before we just uh, I'm actually putting this up now, but again, what we want to encourage you, what we're going to uh, share the next two weeks. Again, we've decided that after looking at the temptation and realizing that we are constantly being tempted, but also understanding how we need to deal with that, uh, learning about the Beatitudes, uh, teaching us how we, how we must deal, how we must keep, look at ourselves. Looking at Matthew 6 and 7, we need to now also learn how Jesus teaches us how to continue to live. Uh, he's, giving, he's going to give us a new set of rules. He's going to give us a new, a new direction, so which will not only deal with, with us as a person, with the B attitude, but also in how we must act and how we must conduct ourselves. So, so I think looking forward, Christu and Alwyn, the three of us really felt that that tonight uh, was important. Friends, we want to encourage you that we are constantly being tempted. Jesus never promised us a life without temptation, but he did promise us a life that if we apply ourselves, and especially the way Christ have shared with us this evening, if we continuously stay with the word, uh, friends, there is nothing that can get us down and there is nothing that can overcome us. So I want to really encourage you that we will stay with what it is God wants us to do. You stay with your purpose. You stay with your plan. You stay with your conviction uh, uh, and, and just allow God to guide you and know that God is really with us. So with that, I'm going to pray for us. So right now I ask that you just close your eyes where you are. Uh, and God, again, we just want to acknowledge that, Lord, by your spirit, we know uh, as your word has gone out tonight, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit. And, it's a, and it, 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 it determines the motives and the intents of the heart of a man. And I pray this evening, and it's our prayer as teachers, that God, that you will cut deep this evening to our hearts, that we will again just see uh, what it is that's going on on the inside, that we will not be afraid to confront those things that need to be confronted, that we will not be afraid to change those things that need to be changed. 
God, in order for us to, to again look up, to look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We make a decision tonight that, God, we will not be distracted and allow this world to distract us from the purpose and the plan that you have for us. God, we will continue to make our mark. We will continue to make a difference because, God, that is what you have called us to be. So we pray for every person. Spirit of God, you uh, comfort them, you encourage them, you give them the confidence to confront and to overcome. And we ask you, Spirit of God, that you will help each one to do boldly that which you want us to do. Amen. So, friends, with that, we encourage you. Thank you again for joining. Christy, you're such a blessing to us, really. Alvin, uh, thank you very much for everyone's input. Friends, thank you for joining us. The next two weeks is really going to be special. We're going to stay with Matthew 6 and 7. After that, we'll go back to the covenant, uh, to Genesis and the covenant. But let's stay with Matthew 6 and 7 and let's see what, uh, let's let's learn more from Jesus' example. So with that, thank you very much, Christu, Alwyn. Bless you, everybody. Goodbye. We appreciate you. Thank you.